to item number three. And uh, we have a presentation by Becky Bradley. Becky, take it away. Uh, thank you. Um, is it okay if I do a screen share, Josh? Okay. Um, Please. <laughs> And thank you, by the way, for working um, your agenda uh, around for, for me. Um, our organization just got an award tonight from the uh, Lehigh Valley's uh, United Way um, uh, organization. And so I was just literally running be between events, which sounds important. And I never really actually get to do that, to be quite honest with you. So I uh, was pretty excited about that. Um, and that gets to talking about the power of partnerships. And I'm going to talk about that as it relates uh, to freight as well. All right. Um, so I don't know what you know or don't know about uh, the Lehigh Valley, but we are the Allentown, Bethlehem, Easton area of Pennsylvania. So we also have the, for better or worse, distinction of being known as one of the fastest growing corridors in the nation for warehousing and logistics, which is what I know I'm supposed to speak about um, this evening. But something's interesting that's happened related to that over the last six years. And I'll show you all kinds of fun data in, in a minute. But our gross domestic product, just in the two counties that make up the Lehigh Valley, which is Lehigh and Northampton counties, uh, is over $47 billion. And that is more than the state of, of Vermont, more than the state of Alaska, and then also more than the state of Wyoming. But shh, that's don't tell the Economic Development Corporation. That one's not saying much. But at the end of the day, it makes us the 88th largest economy in the world. And that's important because you also have a very productive economy. And knowing um, that information and being able to kind of put that in context of what's happening in your communities is really important, especially to this freight conversation. So I pulled a little bit of information because we're both partners in this Metropolitan Area Planning Forum, which I, I know you know about, but it's a mega regional partnership and we work on issues of freight, um, resiliency and other things. And the interesting thing that I figured out when I was preparing for this was this entire map forum, which really kind of organized around freight. It includes the New York City's MPO and North Jersey and all those folks at the Port Authority in New, New York and New Jersey, but a whole lot of Connecticut metropolitan planning organizations and then Orange County, New York, and then us over in Pennsylvania across the moat of the Delaware River. No matter how many alligators and sharks we put in there, it cannot keep the people from moving in. So, uh, but we collectively, all of us together serve 25.8 million people. And we have very specific challenges that are unique to our regions. Um, and I thought one of the things that was really interesting is we're both equidistant from the money center of America, which is Wall Street, which, by the way, as you, you know, is very close to the port of New York and New Jersey, which as of December became the busiest port in the United States of America. And then you have in Connecticut a number of other ports um, as well. So uh, at the end of the day, with all the population growth coming into this map area into the Northeast United States, the challenges that we had in the past have evolved and we're gonna have new challenges into the future. So what does that mean for us, especially around freight and logistics? Um, I really appreciated hearing the reports from the different communities because similar to you, uh, we're a, but a little different in the Pennsylvania version, we're the Metropolitan Planning Organization. So we do the transportation planning investment, but we're also a bi-county planning agency. So we um, largely do uh, advisory review on subdivision land development ordinances, um, subdivision land development plans. Um, we work on multi-municipal and individual comprehensive plans with our local governments, provide a lot of advisory service, but we're also regulatory on stormwater management and water quality, which is a, a little bit different. And I know all of our regional councils are kind of organized a little bit differently, but we get the luxury of being able to tie in the land use with the environmental planning and the economic planning and our parks, rec, and open space, which the conversation I just heard 
is very similar to the types of conversations we have at our board meeting. And so it made me feel really excited to be able to, to show you the rest of this. So we have to start with fact-based optimism. Things are changing so fast. Um, and the information and good quality information is key to having a, a good conversation, especially when so much is changing in the community. And that can be very emotional uh, for not only people in the community, but elected uh, leaders, appointed leaders, and even the staff within the organization. So right now we're sitting at just a little under uh, 700,000 people, uh, just to give you a context, but we've been growing steadily at let's say three to three to six person, thousand persons per year sustained for over 60 years. And we expect to continue to grow. During 2020, when all of Brooklyn moved someplace else, 20,000 folks moved into the Lehigh Valley in a single year, um, creating all kinds of housing issues and other things simultaneously with the growth in, in the need for products to be delivered by Amazon and resources to be delivered to grocery stores. It got a little crazy. So to give you an idea of how much development's been happening since the pandemic, these are just the 22 numbers, uh, the 2022 numbers. So you can see for a, a, a solid year, the pay attention to that navy blue part of both of the donut charts, that's our industrial number. So the one county had over 9.5 million square feet proposed last year and the other county 12.6 million square feet. So this has been sustained now for a long time, but this slide's a little bit different than the last one I showed you. The last one was proposed numbers. This one is what then our local governments who have final approval authority in Pennsylvania have actually approved of all of the proposals that uh, we see them first and provide advisory guidance to the local government, and then they decide what they want to do with it, approve or not. Uh, approve. And that's tricky under our state enabling legislation. But you can see that some total, our local governments have had a significant amount of pressure just since 2017, when we really all started shopping online and in app, and that these warehouse e-commerce and logistics centers um, started to really become the retail of the 21st century. Um, what I think is also important, and you can see that on the far right of the slide, is uh, it kind of tracks what's still in the pipeline. Things that we just call industrial are things like manufacturing, coring. We have a, a Portland cement, Lehigh Portland cement um, was invented here. So we have a very active uh, cement industry, albeit it's sort of contained in places where they can, can quarry. Uh, but we've added a small amount of square feet um, over that time. But we've learned that manufacturing doesn't necessarily need as much square footage under roof as our e-commerce distribution and logistics centers. But notice that we have a 1 million square feet of manufacturing hanging out there, manufacturing and mining. But then we have 21.5 million square feet still in some level of the approval process since 2017 with our local governments. That's a really crazy number. If you would have told me in 2013 when I started working at the Lehigh Valley Planning Commission that we would even be reviewing a million square feet of anything, industrial, e-commerce, logistics, I would have thought you were crazy. And now we're re reviewing millions of square feet uh, every single year. I believe because where you're positioned in between the New York market and the Boston market, that you're probably already seeing some of this. And I obviously don't have the local knowledge that you have, but I can definitely share some strategies and how we're addressing it because it's good and it's bad and it's everything in between. Um, right now, uh, we have over two jobs per person in the Lehigh Valley because of the growth we've had. So that's amazing. I don't think we could have said that uh, a decade or 15 years ago, because uh, you looked at our commuter numbers and you had about half the workers living here and working here and another half going into New Jersey, going down to Philadelphia because we're give or take, you know, an hour between uh, between the two. Um, so we were connected, but we didn't necessarily have enough 
have enough jobs for everybody who wanted to live here and work here. So we've been spending a lot of time, and as we've had a lot of freight growth, it's become important, following the money. So I want to give you an example of what that uh, really, really uh, looks like. So um, we do a couple things. If you're not tracking CBRE, they're a major industrial developer uh, as well as uh, industrial uh, leaseholder, so they rent a lot of property. Their statistics, and they have them by county all across the country where they have industrial holdings, are fairly accurate. They're the most accurate ones that we look at, though there are some others that are, are good, but CBRE has a very good system for tracking uh, your industrial market. But if we follow the money, and this is an example that I gave our board not long ago. So if all of the industrial land uses, so that includes the manufacturing as well as the e-commerce and, and logistics, and we're primarily made up of food manufacturers. So um, sorry, Boston, but most of Sam Adams beer is made here. Um, all of the ocean spray cranberry juice. We're, we're too water rich. We're sitting on a major uh, freshwater aquifer. So there's a ton of high water usage uh, manufacturing uh, here, including medical devices and, and other things. Uh, Olympus cameras, North American and South American ed court headquarters is here. They do a lot of development um, and production of cameras, specifically for the medical industry these days. But okay, so money. Um, we, in the aggregate, pay like if you if you're renting industrial space, and most of it is not owned by the end user. Most of it's leased. You'd pay about six dollars and seventy four cents per square foot per year. Um, so that's up from five dollars per square foot two years ago. So that pandemic times it started to increase as the need to move product from logistics centers increased. So for let's say a five thousand square foot facility, and it's not uncommon now for us to review land development plans that are one point two million, one point three million square feet. But our average size is about five hundred to six hundred thousand square feet per new industrial building. But for that five hundred thousand square feet. Uh, building at uh, $6.74 per square foot per year. Uh, that's $3.37 million a year. So you see with all of your entitlements and your land development costs, these folks that are building these things, and it's largely on speculation, by the way, you will not necessarily know who your end user is. And that's a whole other level of challenges. They're making money. So then you look at the average uh, length of a lease, which is an eight-year average. Um, so across the length of that eight-year lease, that's $26.9 million in rent off of one half a million square foot uh, e-commerce facility for this example. So if you use this across the uh, one point our 141 million square feet of industrial that we have total region wide. The private sector industrial property owners combined are earning like $728 million per year um, in industrial rents. At, and, and then that equates to $2.9 billion over the average eight year lease term. So it really gives you a sense and figuring that out is very easy using um, industrial data like from companies like CBRE or, or JLL and what the actual value of those properties is. And that should help you as you're going through those entitlement and the zoning and the sub, especially the subdivision of land development process in understanding where you can negotiate with these folks. So they have a lot more flexibility to negotiate than let's say a, um, regional home builder who, even though they might be proposing 50 units or 100 units or even more, um, may not necessarily have the capitalization that you'll see with some of these industrial companies. Uh, we recently saw a school district who bought some land for potential um, school development in the future, and they bought that property about 15, 16 years ago. They sold it to an industrial, they bought it I guess this is an important part. I forgot this. They bought it for about $400,000, a little less. They sold it for $52 million raw land. And it's about six acres to an industrial developer. So the money is unlike 
anything that we had seen. And this just hit us fast. So we started looking at, well, then what does this mean in relationship to what's going on in the country? And some of those big port and inland port um, communities all around the country. And what we found out is that we had the highest rate of new freight facility growth in the country and that our vacancy rate was very low because our absorption of the new product that they were building was very high and that you could see there they're having an annual rent growth rate that's exceptional so understanding that will help you be the most astute that you can possibly be when these folks come around so we knew that we had to find we were becoming a little too successful quite frankly so we knew we had to find um, solutions to the challenges that were arising but do that in a smart way that didn't stop the good things that we wanted and in fact supported them, but then manage some of the externalities that we were starting to see. So in, is if it hadn't got crazier with just the volume of what being was being proposed, we started to see proposals for these high cube and automated warehouses. If you haven't heard of these things, um, you can go to our website at lvpc.org. And we wrote a really fast community guide actually in 2020 and then updated it in January 2021 because we had gotten one of these uh, proposals that came in. It was an existing cold storage warehouse about 40 uh, feet high, so roughly four stories. But, you know, industrial, so you can't really tell uh, how many stories it, it is in reality because there's no windows. They had been there for a long time. They wanted to expand, but they didn't have any room to expand to the left or the right. So they decided that they would like to go up. Um, and ultimately, this was litigated in the township one. They wanted to go up 12 stories, so 120 some odd feet. The zoning hearing board actually granted a variance because they liked them. They didn't show hardship. The township sued their own zoning hearing board to um, stop this from moving forward because um, they don't have fire apparatus. It's the, the tallest building in the community is about 50 feet tall and they didn't have fire apparatus to address any emergency uh, management situations in the community. So we realized in that moment that the game had totally changed and that we needed to get out to our 62 local governments that we provide um, supportive services to, to get them the information they needed to start writing new zoning definitions and other things that included these types of land uses and that if there was places where these could go that you could zone for them there but if there were places that they didn't work that you could zone them out um, and this just and, and I'll forward this slide deck over to Josh to share with you guys but we started looking at, well, what's just the traffic impact of these things? And what we saw is it's pretty incredible for these high cube warehouses. In fact, you know, it can be well over a thousand trips per, per day compared to your typical um, standard warehouse, which already has chip, trip generation rate of over 1,700 vehicles per day. So um, we noticed that our neighbors were starting to have similar issues. It just was happening here because you could get to us easier. It's free to get out of New Jersey or it's free to get into New Jersey, but it's never free to get out. Um, and I don't know if you guys realize that, but, and the Pennsylvania tax structure is better than it is in New Jersey. So it was easier for them to dray freight into our region. Also because of uh, Hurricane Sandy, the port, of New York and New Jersey, the electric and the flooding and everything, and all those warehouses around there were knocked out for weeks and weeks and weeks. And so a lot of the grocery store chains lost millions and millions of dollars worth of cold and refrigerated goods. So they started moving our way because it was more, the term at the time was climate safe. No one would really use that now, but we were out of the coastal zone and it was a better deal for those businesses. So we benefited from that for a while until we started drinking from the fire hose. And then we realized our neighbors all the way out to Scranton in Dunder Mifflin territory were starting to see similar things. And so we went to the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation and said, hey, we know we all have to write freight plans. We wrote our first one in, in 2015. And you know, the first plan is always just figuring out what the heck's going on. Well, that plan got blown up 
by all of the freight growth that we had. So all the bridge condition data and all the predictions and freight volumes was like out the window. Our Lehigh Valley International Airport's air cargo, uh, the amount of freight has increased by over a thousand percent in the last four years, if that tells you anything. So the other thing we learned is that freight's inherently multimodal. Our neighbors were starting to see the same thing. So we work with PennDOT to organize a freight alliance, and now we're writing a joint freight plan to meet not only our MPO requirements, but to hopefully designate freight routes. Because the other thing that we noticed was that freight knows no bounds. It just needs to get where it needs to get. And with electronic logging um, devices in tractor trailers and limits on their time, um, we were starting to see some really wacky things happening and shortcuts and other things. You're no different than we are in the fact that a lot of your area, but not all of it, was you know really laid out and developed prior to the car. So we have gorgeous covered bridges and stone arch bridges and all those awesome things that you want to see when you're coming into Pennsylvania or going into Connecticut or Massachusetts and all those beautiful things that are historic and really define who we are. But you can't take tractor trailers across those and definitely not at any frequency. And we're starting to see these crazy movements and bridge collapses and all this craziness. So we're working on that plan right now. Simultaneously, um, the Northampton County Executive, which is one of our counties, said, whoa, Lehigh County had all this development back in the day. We're going to get it, too. We're starting to get it, but like, we don't want to look like them. So as a regional council and the diplomats in, in the game, um, we talked to both counties and said, hey, we're happy to work on Northampton County's issues, but Lehigh County, could you also allow us to work on your specific issues as soon as we're done with Northampton? And that's what we're working on now. But I want to switch um, and show you this really cool thing that we did, because I would highly recommend it if you're starting to get, well, any significant change. We just focused one on freight, is um, the amazing people that I work with, Team GIS in team transportation planning, created an online map where we literally loaded everybody's zoning code and then organized it in general categories so we could start to see where different things were allowed within uh, Northampton County. Um, so you can click on stuff. So we looked at everything from landfills to manufacturing uses to quarrying to food production um, to even uh, oil and gas. And you can see from this map that it's literally almost everywhere in the county. Our local governments didn't realize that they had had so much land um, zoned for industrial development, especially when you get up in Lehigh and Moore townships, which the Blue Mountain is our northern border and the Appalachian Trail runs along that. And it's beautiful um, farmland that goes into natural land. And it's really, really important for protection of our water quality. But it's really what people think of when they think of our region as being this beautiful mix of natural and built environments. And they've prioritized that time and time again is being a priority um, in our work. And so we felt that we had a responsibility then to start working with these local governments to be able to um, update their zoning. In Pennsylvania, it's basically a right to develop state. So what that basically means is if you're not in a multi-municipal comprehensive plan, you are required to have every zoning use that you could possibly think of allowed on at least three parcels in every community. So we ran at this issue and started organizing um, six different multi-municipal comprehensive plan um, uh, groups and organizing everybody in county uh, in within both counties so they could start to zone out things like high cube warehouses where they didn't make sense and where you don't have the infrastructure for them zone in manufacturing uses that are heavy water and sewer users in places where we had water and sewer capacity or it could be easily extended uh, and started really picking off the overall policy so then they could start to work on managing their land uses a little bit better. Because I'm sure like you guys, people put zoning codes in in the 1960s and 70s and 80s. And there's a lot of zoning in like general industrial districts. But now we have all kinds of uses like the high cube. 
So we actually wrote a community guide. It's available on this website here. And again, I'll give this to Josh so he can share it with you. And feel free to reach out to me at any time. We're doing some cool stuff with our new carbon reduction funds um, that are coming into our metropolitan planning organization. We're kind of a purple area. So some places you can talk about climate uh, change and climate action and other places you can't. What really matters is that we're having flooding issues. Um, we're having emergency services delivery issues. And so working on those and then helping our air quality because we're in a valley is something that we're taking very seriously. So we're actually working on different projects to make sure that we're investing those new resources that are becoming available to us and things. Uh, and that's as part of our long range transportation plan update that's underway right now. We're also doing some community needs surveys around that. And I just want to end on this. The level of technical assistance that we are providing, providing to our local governments has more than quadrupled in the last six to seven years. We now have an on-call technical assistance program. We did 44 of them last year where local governments can call us and say, hey, we're having these issues with trucks. And now all of a sudden the kids are having trouble getting across the street to get to schools. So we'll literally go out, one of our staff with a transportation engineer who may or may not work with PennDOT, but PennDOT is helping to support this program. Um, we have transportation engineers on staff, but we also have a planner on staff. And so depending on how it works out, we'll go out and do a technical assistance visit or what we call a tech assist visit, and then give them a report within two weeks. And then that gets them in the pipeline for transportation improvement program funding to help address whatever the issue is. We've also have what we call a general assembly. It's a meeting of all 62 local governments, both counties, our state, and federal elected officials, as well as our 17 school districts. We meet twice a year to go over the needs for the region. Um, and we've been having some really serious discussions with them about what they need and the training they need. And then we've been developing transformative talks around that. And then we've also been um, working with the Pennsylvania Municipal Planning Education Institute, which is just a subset of our American Planning Association um, chapter for Pennsylvania to do a lot of general community planning training, uh, zoning and what that means under our state enabling le legislation, getting our zoning hearing boards and zoning officers trained um, on how to address these types of issues, whether it's new housing construction or how do you deal with a car wash um, where you didn't expect to have one to these larger industrial issues, as well as um, teaching our local planning commissions how to do basic things like review plans, but also to write plans. And so that's been really important and getting out there to try to manage some of these issues. And then we've been doing some really simple, we call them their Photoshops. We just use Adobe Photoshop. We'll, we'll go out. This is um, Bath Borough. It's a National Register Historic District. It's an it, intersection of five uh, two-lane state roads. It's now become a freight path between our region and our neighbors in the Poconos to the north. So we've been going through and saying, okay, well, we can't limit truck traffic there. This is an important truck route, but how can we make it more safe? Um, and then we've been tying that into our uh, transit strategy and every land use of regional significance that we get, we send to the transit agency, take their comments, weave them into our review letter. And then um, in some cases, we'll even do renderings of how transit can intersect with biking, walking, and our freight mobility, because we're seeing all kinds of new patterns and paths that we didn't see before. Um, and this is really helping our local leaders start to make decisions on where they spend their money, where we can partner with them, and where we can even develop public-private partnerships, which we're now on our fourth public-private partnership. We build an interchange. Um, we work with FedEx. FedEx Ground opened its largest uh, ground hub north of the Lehigh Valley International Airport in the world just a few years ago. Um, that was obviously a massive game changer for us, but we work with them in a public-private partnership uh, where they invested over $120 million into the roadway system, and we only had to invest like 10. We're doing another public-private partnership interchange project and a new um, complete street that can help will help connect uh, a disadvantaged neighborhood um, to jobs that are being generated by these industrial facilities. This is where freight is good. And this is important. 
as retail and in-store shopping declines, like in person, there's still going to be some, but not as much as there was. Those jobs are minimum wage, a little bit over minimum wage. Warehouse jobs are paying $18 to $22 an hour. They usually start 16 to 17, and then they work up within six months to 18 to $19 and so on and so forth. They're giving them health care, sign-on bonuses, and other things. So this has been a massive, it's still hard. You can't live here well on even $20 an hour, and you certainly will have trouble affording housing. But there's a big difference between, you know, $10 an hour and $18 an hour. And so it's made a huge difference for um, some of our uh, less educated workforce or people just looking for part-time jobs, like retirement gigs, picking and packing or other things. So there's a lot of opportunity in some of these jobs as well. We've also seen a real increase in the need for skilled labor, uh, especially people who could do robotics, um, people who can uh, repair machinery, who can program um, automated uh, forklifts and, and other things. So it has helped the professional and the gray collar sector in our region as well. So we just have to work together on these issues. And I hope I gave you a kind of a nice interview overview of um, some of the things going on here and maybe some tips for some of the things that you can work on in your region. Wow. Becky, thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions or uh, anything you would like to say to Becky? I have a question. Okay. Does the for the amount of traffic that you're seeing from the freight houses and the sizes of the trucks, does that this is my newbie experience, does that have to how much does that affect how the roads are built? Oh well you hit right. on um you hit on one of the most important issues. It's not just the bridges. That's obvious because they you you can see the structures of those, you know, being compromised. But we had to rebuild a section of what's uh, a State Route 100 that is right near the intersection with I-78 because there was good, good manufacturing and industrial growth there. But because of the increase in truck traffic, as well as uh, box trucks and um, employee traffic, the road subsurface was not built to withstand that those high weight and high frequency movements. So we had to move close to $40 million from our long range plan into the short term transportation improvement program to entirely rebuild a road that's about a mile and a quarter long. I mean, it was an insane amount of money, but that's what we had to do to protect protect the economy and then make it continue to the the, the system the system to continue to function for those businesses around. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Oh uh, yeah, uh, Becky, it's Gino Di Giovanni. I have a question. So, <clears throat> all, after Sandy and Irene, I guess, like you said, some of the uh, warehouses, um, maybe the factories, they uh, they figured out that they needed to, you know, move maybe inland a little bit. But all the <clears throat> All the slides that you had here, the 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 amount of volume increase. Where, how did all this, how did the volume increase so much in a short period of time? I guess number one, and and then number two, where where has it increased from? You know, um, obviously, are we just bringing more product into the United States, or is it getting, um, I guess brought into the ports on this side of the United States or has the um, the total um, freight increased throughout the whole country and we're just a small part of the increase here? I don't know if you know the answers to those, but I just think that this is so much more freight than we've seen, I don't know, ever or in a long period of time. And where is it coming from? All of those, literally oh. all of those. Okay. Um, especially since they raised that Verrazano bridge. And so now they can bring those really big tanker uh, or excuse me, the um, uh, really big um, uh, ships in that can have the containers that are stacked even higher. So that really opened up the port of New York and New Jersey. But the problem is they did that project 
their MPOs between NIMTIC and New, New Jersey, uh, North Jersey Transportation Planning Authority. They did that project with the Delaware, with the uh, Tollbridge Commission. Um, and as a result of that, all these ships were coming in that were bigger than they ever could, but they don't have enough room on the site at the port to stack the containers. So they basically had to dray them is what they call it over to some place and we were cheaper is basically it. So for better or worse, it's coming whether we want it to or not. So I look at it as, and look, I got a, last year I got a death threat. People are so angry about the fact that their communities have changed. It, it wasn't credible. It, it was a lady, she was just mad. She was that frustrated. And I actually felt sad for her, but she was so frustrated that even though I was there to like help the community figure out what they could do with their zoning, she just had like hit that flashpoint. And just needed to get it out. And so really wasn't it me. But that's how angry people are. <laughs> They're like well, saying things that they wouldn't normally say. These are reasonable people. So there's some good things that are happening with this. And some things that some communities have so substantially changed. That people are really upset about it. And so finding that place where we can try to work together and have respect for each other because it's the only way we're going to manage this is is been i think one of our biggest challenges because it's just exponential no one could have predicted this nobody wow. so you're saying that the, the freight was this where did the freight go that couldn't be handled by the new york new jersey places it did it go yeah. into philadelphia no no, oh, they're in competition. The ports are out for money, right? That's the one thing I've learned is part of this. And so they just want to get the port, the freight off the port and out to wherever it needs to go. So it could be to a warehouse out here. It could be to a warehouse in North Jersey. It could be to a warehouse in Waterbury somewhere, right? In one of your communities. It could be in a variety of places that the uh, containers need to go. They just need to get them out of the port as fast as possible because they're out of like stacking capacity. So they just can't keep it there. But Correct. If they can just take those containers, put them on a truck, and then send them out. That's all that matters, right? I just, I just think that the the volume increased so much that you could only put five pounds of something in a five pound box. So, <clears throat> you know, when they raised the bridge and you could get more container ships and maybe bigger ones in now, so you have more, you have more capacity. But it still doesn't add up in, in my eyes to we had the same amount of freight. We increased a little bit because we can get a little, you know, we could get, you know, 10% more product on a ship at one time. Something else, in my opinion, you know, is, is, is the cause of it. Maybe it's, you know, more people buying online and more shipping of product, mm -hmm. maybe more import of product from other countries, you know, something like mm -hmm. that. Or also, too, from California when we had some changes on the ports, uh, you know, in, in California and the trucking on the West Coast, you could only have, your truck has to meet certain criteria. So a lot of times now they're coming into Florida and up the East Coast. I don't know how much that, you know, works out here, but that's gotta be part of the reason too, I'm, um, I assume. It is, and you hit on something I didn't mention before, the labor issues out in California. Also, uh, and again, I'm not making a judgment call. It's just what's going on. The emission standards for uh, tractor trailers are, are are really hot. They're higher out in the West Coast than they are in the East Coast. And, and so it's cheap, a, and they cheaper to operate a, them here. Oh, I'm sorry. And they passed a Sorry. bill or an ordinance or something along the way where you can't be an owner operator anymore. I think that went into effect last year or something. So you have to be, you know, hired on through a, you know, Warner or um, Schneider, one of these bigger companies. You can't just have your own truck or one or two trucks and drive into the ports. And that seems like it's a big issue as well. Why did they ad ad adopt that type of regulation? It's California. I don't, I don't know the reason why, but they had a lot of... Uh, you know, the unions and the truckers and, you know, it was a big to-do out there. 
<clears throat> about it. You know, a lot of people didn't want to do it. And all it did was slow down the freight. And that's why they had big problems in the uh, Long Beach port and whatnot. And we are the home of Mack trucks, too. Mm -hmm. So um, we've always been friendly to the tractor trailer, if that makes sense. But interestingly enough, Mack trucks... Um, successfully because they're now owned by volvo but they successfully made a new all-electric trash truck that they tested out in new york city because that's the la largest trash collection system in the country um and it turned out to be like wildly reliable and successful and it was cheaper to operate so they put in the city of new york put in such a large order at mac trucks that they had to stop production of their bread and butter cabs their tractor trailer cabs to just fill this trash truck order so that's not a dynamic that we had ever heard before either from our more um you know uh it, from our industrial partners in the region and so i think that told me that times are changing <laughs> and that the companies themselves are starting to innovate as well and they're going to be trying a lot of uh things out there that relate to the freight industry um because trash truck and trash hauling is obviously part of freight as well and so um it that's another indicator that it's just a different time. So we've got to start evolving where we can to meet that. I just want to make sure that if you haven't got the drinking from the fire hose thing uh, out your, your way, up your way, seriously, take a look at some of the writing that we did on high cube and automated warehouses. I know your enabling legislation for land use is different than ours, but I hope there's some good nuggets in there from the Northampton County freight-based land use stuff to the high cube that might at least get you thinking on um, how you might want to get in front of some of these things that are coming because you don't really know when they're going to happen. Um, and we learned that we've always had manufacturing, but we didn't envision that we would go from six manufacturing districts to 12 in under a decade. Uh, and we didn't envision that they were, were going to want to build in completely rural areas that were like 10 miles off a decent roadway that could take a lot of tractor trailers. And then we also learned that freight is inherently multimodal. So like this jacket I got on, in all likelihood, it was manufactured someplace in, in Asia, was put on a container ship and shipped somewhere and then moved to a warehouse and then I ordered it online. It showed up and it fit, so I kept it, but it was delivered to my house in a box truck. Um, jewelry's usually shipped in the bellies of passenger airplanes, believe it or not, um, and so high dollar value goods and perishables. So you might be riding on that next United flight with a whole bunch of tomatoes um, when you're coming back from your uh, California trip. And so there's so much to know about freight that it in some ways becomes overwhelming. And one of the books I think that helped me understand it best, it's a little nerdy, but it, it's worth even just reading the summary of it online, is called Door to Door because that talks about how many different types of freight movements actually go into getting us the products that we consume every day. Wow. Becky, I cannot thank you enough. What a, a fascinating... Can I ask one more question? Oh, certainly, please, Marcus. What did they do to the Verrazano Bridge? Did they, did they build a brand new deck? They raised it, yeah. They figured out how to engineer it to, like, raise it up so they could fit larger ships underneath it. Raise it up or open it up? Raise it up. Raise it up. It's not a draw. It's not a drawbridge. It's a fixed. Yeah, it's not it's a, a drawbridge. Yeah. yeah, it's a fixed suspension bridge. Right. Mm -hmm. How long ago was that? Two years ago, I think they wrapped it up. It was underway for like a long, long while. Mm -hmm. And that was financed by the uh, Port Authority. I believe sure. so, and I think both of the MPOs were partners in that: the NIMTIC and the New Jersey North Jersey Transportation Planning Authority. So they're all our neighbors, you know, they're an MPO away or they're immediately adjacent to us. So these are people that we know. And that gets back to why this map forum is so important. Even if I'm not going to directly do business with the New York Metropolitan Transportation Council, or you might not um, do a, a joint project with them either, you're 
only an MPO or so away and me too. Um, and again, we're both equidistant from Wall Street. Um, we're both equidistant from major markets. And so that I know is attractive to the freight industry. Hmm. Becky, would you mind sharing what your background is? Oh, yes. This is the area. Allentown and Bethlehem like, no, grew your, together. Your, your personal background and your training, because you're so no. well-spoken about this. And, and I can't get over how much information you presented. I was just happy to talk more about Allentown and Bethlehem. And, um, no, I, I'm uh, I'm originally from Springfield, Illinois. Uh, I grew up on a farm that looked much like Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz. Um <laughs> And uh, unless uh, you're male, it, it, you don't really farm where I'm from. It's a pretty traditional place. So um, I went to undergraduate in Missouri. Um, and then I went and worked in downtown revitalization for a while for the Illinois Main Street program. And I found planning there. Uh, it was found it really interesting. And at the time, it was because Walmarts were going into rural America. And that was um, pro providing opportunities and challenges, just like freight is here for those communities and working with them to keep their traditional downtowns. Um, and after four years of doing that, I uh, decided I wanted to become a planner. Uh, I applied to a couple schools and I got into the U University of Pennsylvania, which somebody like me from the middle of nowhere doesn't get into. So I sucked it up and went, paid it off last year, 20 years after being graduated. Yes. Um, but uh, I met my husband uh, in Philadelphia and he's from the Lehigh Valley. His family's lived here on the same piece of property since 1732. So uh, I'm going to die here now. And I'm totally fine with that. Um, There's a beautiful community with amazing people. And I've been a planner uh, here for the last 20 years. Good for you. Uh, uh, did the uh, towns that you said that a lot of the development was occurring, that they were looking at farms. How did those towns cope with developers that would basically come in and sort of like bulldoze them around. I mean, um, I mean the potential for a, a fancy developer, accustomed knowing what they do, to walk into a town that has very little staff, very little anything, no money, probably. And, you know, if a company comes in, it's sort of like, no, this is what we want. This is how it's going to be done. That's it. Was that what happened? Uh, sometimes that happens. Um, I mean, some of the freight development's great. I didn't really want to bore you with any maps because um, they're a little hyper local for this. But some of the freight developments, like right up against I seventy eight, where it should be, or US twenty two, which is kind of our main street, takes more cars than the inter or in vehicles than the interstate. But a lot of folks will just call us as a regional council, and that's where the work that you guys do and the staff of NV Cog is so important, because you bridge all the same issues that we do: the land use, the housing, the environment, all those things that you guys are astute on those. And the local governments being able to kind of have us even on the phone for advice was important. Um, some of those rural communities uh, were like great. This is going to add a ton of money to the tax base, and we want it. And other communities, those who may be ruled by the Pennsylvania Dutch dynasty, that's what, or Dutch mafia, depending on if you, it's a joke, but, um, you know, some of them, they don't want change. So they just banded together to um, make sure it didn't happen or that there were significant negotiations to make it as additive to the community as possible. Uh, one of uh, the Dutch dynasty communities did a great job of negotiating. So they created like a, a little industrial park uh, right near I-78, uh, made sure that they had the trucker services like the truck stop and the truck parking locations built in. The developers that worked on that property, including Hillwood, which is Ross Perot's company, if everybody re remembers him, um, and JLL and CBRE, um, they negotiated to get a a new fire station adjacent to that with appropriate equipment uh, to be able to address any of the issues in the industrial park that they just built um, and to help build a package plant for sewer because it's totally rural and they didn't have any sewer or water just as well and on lot septic everywhere. So some of them have done it well, even and then still maintain their rural character around that. 
and then others um, not so much. So we've got every version of that, I would say. Again, thank you so much.